Hello and welcome to Southeastern 16's Baseball Weekly. It's our weekly baseball show. Today, we do this on Tuesday night in between the conclusion of the Major League Baseball Draft and the start of the All-Star Game. I got a 10-year-old just outside my office who's eagerly waiting my presence to watch the All-Star Game. <laughs> so if you're a baseball fan, it doesn't get a lot better than this. You get the All-Star Game. And the conclusion of the draft in the same day. We're here to talk about the draft today. This is going to be exclusively a draft show. We'll do some portal talk and things like that next week. But uh, i got Graham Doty and Alfred Esmond joining me. Guys, we're representing the Braves, the A's, and the Rays, respectively, if you're looking at this. I'll give credit to Graham for starting the trend. I had to, had to follow through. <laughs> but anyway, uh, a reminder, our content brought to you by Bet Online. Your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season from baseball, golf, soccer, right up to all the top fights in UFC and MMA and in boxing, every stat, every matchup, even live odds and spreads while the games are being played. When the game is over, head on over to our online casino, get in on a game of blackjack or poker, unwind with one of our over 150 slots games. Head to the website today. Get in on all the action. Use promo code BELIEVE. That is in all caps, B-L-E-A-V, for your 50% bet credit on your first deposit up to $250. Bet online. The game starts here. All right, topics today. We're going to each pick our three biggest storylines, our three biggest surprises, and three things worth noting. Uh, we'll do winners and losers at the end and, and anything else that comes up. So, gentlemen, are we ready to go? Let's start on biggest storylines of the draft from an SEC perspective, or if you caught something else, that's fine, too. Alfred, we'll go. We'll each give our first pick, and then we'll go back in order, give our second pick, and so on. Your biggest storyline as it pertains to the SEC in this year's draft. Yeah, I'm going to start, I guess, with kind of an elephant in the room, at least on the first night, was Jack Caglione going sixth. Um, I think in that moment when it happened, I a lot of people thought, I guess from an MLB perspective, just briefly for a sec, the White Sox were going to take him fifth, but they went a different direction, went Hagen Smith. That entails some deadline stuff they'll do, blah, blah, blah. But uh, the Royals ended up picking Caglione, and they set themselves up nicely. I mean, I, I think that the – word on the street is his bat and his contact is just is ready to excel uh he's a guy that they're going to throw in a double a i think right off the bat mm. and see what he can do at that level uh and then progress further and further if all if all ends up well you could see him playing in the mlb in 2025 um and, and that's the bottom line I, I think it's i think the contact and the batting's there the biggest question and i think this adds to the storyline is whether or not they'll let him go in a two-way position uh, TBD. I think that's hard to do if you if you kind of throw him in the double A right off the bat. But at the same time, I, I wouldn't put it past him. All the guys on ESPN when I was watching, they loved. They seemed to like the the pitching stuff he had. Obviously, it was a work in progress and whatnot. But I, I mean, you saw there's videos on Twitter of Caglione hitting with a wooden bat. It's absolutely no change in how he's hitting the baseball whatsoever. It's it, it's a very interesting storyline. And a lot of people said the Royals, you know, got the the, uh, the steal of the draft, I guess. And they had possibly, in my opinion, one of, if not the best player in this draft, fall right into their lap at six. And already with Bobby Witt Jr. and all these guys in their system, they, they have a good future ahead of them. Graham, your number one storyline of the draft. Great minds think alike, Alfred. I had the, that was my number one too. And it was, it was, it was Jack Caglione. And it was mainly because... Kansas City, they did announce, they did tell them, yes, you can you can play both ways. You can hit and you can pitch. Now, how long will they commit to that? That is to be determined. So that that is why it's fascinating to me. I, I kind of think a lot of people take the Shohei Otani stuff for granted just because of how easy he makes it look and just how good he is pitching and hitting. It's not that easy. It's so much time, energy, and effort to not only be a position player, but also to hone that in to be a pitcher as well. So that was my number one, just the fact that he fell to six 
And then the fact that immediately Kansas City came out and said, yes, you can hit and pitch. So I will be fascinated to see where they send him. Do they immediately send him to double A? If they do, double A is where you it's make or break. It's where all the top prospects go and you find out quickly, is this somebody that is going to be a superstar and can make it? Or will they just kind of be another guy? So that was my number one as well. I just thought it was fascinating for a variety of reasons. Yeah, my storyline, number one storyline, touches on Jack Caglione. And that is just that the SEC is developing some incredible top-end talent. Jack Caglione was the third SEC player off the board behind Charlie Condon, who went third to the Rockies, and Hagen Smith, who went fifth to the White Sox, by my count, 13 different SEC schools, guys, had guys picked in the top 100. I'll just give you a list of guys. In addition to those three, Braden Montgomery went to the Red Sox at 12. Christian Moore, Angels at 8. Gerangelo St. Joe, Mariners at 15. Tommy White, Brewers at 14. Ryan Walshmitt, Diamondbacks, 31 overall. Billy Amick, from Tennessee, twins at 60. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. Ben Hess was on there to the Yankees in the first round. Luke Holman in competitive B to the Reds. Um, Bryce Cunningham goes, what was it, 53rd to the Yankees. Drew Beam, 76 to the Royals. Um, Blake Burke, 34th to the Brewers. Jared Thomas, 42nd to the Rockies. Gage Jump, 73rd to the A's. Ryan Prager, who I thought might get through the draft and go back to AM, 81st to the Angels. Carter Holton, 62 to the Braves. Dylan Dryling, 65th to the Rangers. I mean, that's that's a lot of names. I'm calling them for a while, but that underscores my point. This league has got just some incredible talent. Uh, if you're an SEC baseball fan, you have never seen talent like this in the league what we're doing in this league year in and year out. Uh, it happened last year, too. We already got two or three guys in the big leagues from last year's draft who were playing in the SEC 13 months ago. And by the way, I, I said 13 teams represented. No Missouri, no Ole Miss. Uh, Oklahoma was also not represented in the top 100, but had John Spikerman in the top 50. So if you want to go top 50, 14 of the 16 teams had guys picked in the top 150. All right, storyline number two, Alfred. I'm going to go, you just said his name when you were going through all the picks. Uh, Christian Moore going to the Angels. I'll highlight that pick too as another storyline. The reason I'm highlighting it is uh, the Angels really have struggled. Again, I'm using the MLB perspective too here. The Angels have struggled to develop really good hitters in their system. Uh since really Mike Trout, it seems like for the most part, and that's, you know, way in the rear view mirror at this point. And same thing with Shohei Otani since he's not there anymore. Uh, and Christian Moore, finally, it seems like, you know, it gives the Angels an opportunity to, to develop a top end guy. Moore was expected, I think, for the most part in mock drafts heading up to it to be around 12, where the Red Sox were picking sort of that early teens area. But he ends up going high, and it, once again, it, it, the top-end talent you've seen around the SEC, more is the epitome of that. Uh, he would have been in a lot of award finalists' lists had some of these other guys not existed this season. And uh, you just look at what he could do, the powers there this season, 34 home runs, uh, slugging up near 800, the on-base is 450. It, it, all that stuff is incredible, and you know the Angels are a team that really needs to find some kind of hitters in their farm system that's already not one of the great ones in Major League Baseball. So Moore possibly has an opportunity to change that, and who knows, maybe the Angels, this puts them in the right direction a little bit with at least developing some of the younger guys, which is what they're going to have to start doing with Mike Trout aging out at this point, or his career at least aging out at this point, and no more Tani. Graham, your number two storyline. Well, since since I'm an Ole Miss fan, it was it was the Ole Miss pitching staff. I feel like the last time we got together, <laughs> it felt like the whole <laughs> pitching staff, bullpen starters, felt like everybody was jumping ship. So I was very curious to see what the draft would look like and just how the, everything would settle and play out. 
Um, we're recording this on Tuesday. So Monday night, Riley Maddox, who was really the Friday, Saturday guy uh, this past season for Ole Miss, he did announce that he is coming back. So it was on the table. He could get drafted. He could have transferred, obviously. So he announced that he's coming back, which is absolutely huge for Ole Miss. And then the other thing, which we touched on last time, what would Hunter Elliott and Xavier mm-hmm. Rivas do? Neither one of them pitched this past season with arm injuries. So Xavier Rivas, he got picked up in the 16th round. He got drafted by the Yankees. And by the way, I feel like the Yankees drafted nothing but pitchers in the yeah. draft. They got pitcher after pitcher. So I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards Rivas is going gonna, is gonna to sign. I mean, he's already made the announcement. Like, he feels pro ball. There would be no rush. You know, he can take his time coming back from the injury. If he comes back to Ole Miss, he's going to have to pitch right away and also pitch at a high level. So, he hasn't made an announcement one way or the other, but I'm I'm leaning towards he's going to sign. And then the other one is uh, the other big one, Hunter Elliott. It looked like he would not get drafted. And then, of course, the Dodgers swoop in in the 20th round and take him. So, it's kind. Of, it's going to depend on what he wants to do. Does he just want to go ahead and start his pro career, or does he want to come back? If he if he comes back to Ole Miss, I'm pretty confident Ole Miss is going to pay him a, a big amount of money. But same thing, he's going to have to pitch early, and he's going to have to be good. What Ole Miss fans saw when he was a true freshman and pitching in the national championship series against Oklahoma. The other one is is uh, Mason Nichols. Same thing. Would he get drafted? Would he transfer? Uh, as we're recording this, I think the 20th round is still going on. He has not been selected uh, while we're recording this, so he could be picked late in the 20th round. But uh, he's from Jackson, Mississippi, so he it's kind of trending towards he'll come back to Ole Miss, but again, you never know. But for Ole Miss, it was looking like there would be no returning starting pitching or their top bullpen arms will be on the team this upcoming season they got good news with riley maddox and everybody is just waiting decisions for mason nichols and hunter elliott yeah too by the way nichols was not picked drafts now done so um okay. we can file that one away two things you said magnolia state pitching that that's going to be a topic i'll bring up somewhere later in the show because i've got some thoughts on that and y- your point about the yankees I, I was watching that like are the yankees just going to draft 20 SEC pitchers because I think they went <laughs> off the top. They went Ben Hess at uh, at 26. They went Bryce Cunningham from Vanderbilt at what 53 second round. Yeah, yeah. Then they went. I, I, I've kind of got this. They went Thatcher Hurd from LSU at 89. That was kind of interesting because Hurd had gone into portal. You know, could still use that as some leverage. Griffin Herring from LSU at 181 overall. Uh, Grayson Carter from Vanderbilt at 152 overall. Um, I'll go down a little further. Um, Tanner Palman from Harvard, ninth round, pick 271. I mean, that was that was you, you didn't really think of the SEC as a pitching league. And, and I think right now, you know, the, the hitting is so out of whack that it's making good pitchers look bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but the the pros like the arm uh, Xavier Rivas from Ole Miss another one at 481. So yeah, I, I noticed that too. It's like boy, the Yankees are, are loving these SEC arms. Okay, my number two storyline for the draft involving SEC teams is this, guys. I think NIL is a difference maker. Now I cannot prove this on all these guys, but I was talking to a guy that's pretty well connected. He said I think NIL you're going to see schools use NIL to get some of these guys back that are that are good prospects, but maybe not great pro prospects. And I'll give you some guys that were listed as top 250 guys at either Baseball America or MLB Pipeline that came back. Jalen Flores at Texas, shortstop, who I think, I can't remember if he was a JUCO kid. He was, he was a kid who just you know, has committed to Texas. That's one. Uh, went undrafted. Chris Stanfield, LSU outfielder at Auburn last year, went to LSU through the portal. He didn't get picked. Uh, Jonathan Vastine at Vanderbilt, shortstop. Going to be maybe on the short list for best shortstops in the league going into next year after he didn't get picked. Jared Jones at LSU, maybe their best hitter this year. First baseman, draft-eligible sophomore. Had had a lot of leverage with that sophomore year. LSU is is has been on the cutting edge, probably day in Tennessee, 
They've been the two most aggressive teams at using NIL money. Jaron Jones goes undrafted. Luke Heyman, a little further down the list, kind of barely inside the top 250, but played really well in the postseason. Eli Jerzenbeck, didn't talk about him a lot. Talented arm who's been at South Carolina a bit. Um, I, I can't remember if he's got eligibility or not. I have to look that up for sure. And Pierce Coppola, a, a guy that three, four years ago would have been a first rounder. We've talked about his injury situation in his way back. Uh, you, you thought that an ML team, MLB team might take a chance. I mean, it's not a chance. You Coppola is a guy that easily goes in 20 rounds, but the fact that he didn't makes me wonder if maybe, hey, Florida's made him a, a Florida's another program that uses NIL. Said, hey, come back, boost your stock. Get paid while you're here. So that was that was a big storyline. Is just looking at oh, and Hunter Hines, another one. Um, I'm not sure if Hines was on the top, but I mean that's that's a really good hitter that Mississippi State got through the draft. So th- there are more, uh, but I, I just kept thinking, I will bet you some of these kids uh, are signing sweetheart nil deals and, and guys that probably you would have seen go pro even a, a year or two ago are now probably coming back to college, which I think makes for a better game. All right, uh, the third biggest storyline on your list, please, Alfred. Yeah, you touched on it a little, Chris, and I think the NIL will play a factor into it, but a lot of LSU pitchers got selected during this draft. That staff next year is going to look a whole lot different, and it connects to, this was a story leading up to it, uh, Will Schmidt, a recruiter there, is pulling out mere hours before the first round began, and he would have been a first-rounder had he stayed in. He would have gotten picked somewhere. But he pulls out, and that that's that's something LSU is probably thankful for, basing it off of how many pitchers got picked for them. I mean, if I go down the list here, uh, Luke Holman to the Reds, Gage Jump to the Aids, Hurd and Herring to the Yankees. Hurd, although, is interesting, like you said, Chris, because of the NIL leverage he has. And some of these other guys probably have some as well. Uh, Uloa to the Rockies, Ackenhausen to the Royals, Little uh, to the Mariners, and Justin Lohr in the 13th round. He went to the Rockies as well. Uh, I I think it's, and you know, another guy too, who I loved, who didn't really necessarily get a ton of good reps in at LSU cam Johnson's bound for Mm -hmm. Oklahoma this year uh, in the portal. And he's gone at this point Uh, the the LSU staff will look a lot different, but I think there's some promising arms, obviously of Schmidt coming out of high school. Uh, Zach Cowan is a Wofford guy who had a lot of good, good outings uh, in mid-major ball who can surprise them. But, I think that's a big thing to watch if any LSU people are watching is just, you know, what what is your pitching staff going to look like? And it's not necessarily a knock, but it, it's going to be totally different names unless some of them come back f- due to NIL compensation. Yeah, guys, my – let's say, uh, Graham, I'm sorry, you're next. Your you're third biggest storyline. Kind of a similar thing as Alfred. I prom I promise we didn't get together and share our <laughs> top three. But well, we don't we don't no. do that. We, yeah, just as yeah. a no. fact for so, the listeners, we we do these blindly, so none of us knows what the other guy's going to say. Yeah. So so mine are LSU and Tennessee. I'll touch on LSU first, and and what Alfred touched on in in the William Smith. So like he he was the top right handed pitcher arm in the draft, and he he was going to be a first round draft pick. So he makes the decision. I'm not going to sign. I'm, I'm going to go to LSU. Now he's from Baton Rouge. I'm sure he grew up a diehard LSU Tiger fan and has always wanted to pitch for the purple and gold. So they have him. He'll be on campus. And I'm pretty sure that he will be a weekend starter for LSU or they're going to give him every opportunity to be. So that, that was a big one for me, which Smith, the other ones, a good day for Tennessee, Jay Abernathy, middle infielder, lefty, and Tegan Coons, if you if I'm pronouncing that rightly, he's a right-handed mm-hmm. pitcher. They are both going to be in Knoxville, so those are both right, right around top 150 uh, prospects. They forego the draft, and, and they're going to play um, in Knoxville for the Tennessee Vols. So the defending national champs get good news there, two of their top high school prospects will be on campus at least for the next three years. All right, Graham, you stole my thunder, but I'll play off it. I, I had Tennessee <laughs> as just a storyline in general, and, and some of it was getting kids through the draft. I think the bigger thing to me was just the number of current players they had picked and where we talked about how Tennessee had guys picked high. Christian Moore, eighth overall to the Angels. Billy Amick, 60th to the Twins. Drew Beam, 76th to the Royals. 
Blake Burke, 34th to the Brewers. Dylan Drying, 65th to the Rangers. Tavares Tears, 134th to the Padres. Sorry for being a little repetitive there, but I'm just trying to underscore my point. And then later down the draft, you had A.J. Causey, 138 to the Royals. You had Aaron Combs, 229 to the White Sox. Um, I think that's it. What's that, eight guys? And then they had the um, the kid from Niagara. Niagara. I guess it's Eric Radisak, uh, the, the transfer who's got the interesting story. He got taken in the seventh, the 16th round by the Marlins. That's another guy on the roster, although he hasn't played for Tennessee yet, so that's like a bad news item potentially. But I just thought the Vols, as they were all season, and then, of course, into Omaha, the defending national champs, uh, showed up as a story in the draft, too, and, and really no surprise if you – you did your homework ahead of time on this. Gentlemen, let's move on to three biggest surprises. We'll just stay in the same order. We'll go Alfred, Graham, and then me. We'll each get in one and then move to the next one. Alfred, your biggest surprise of the draft in, in terms of SEC storylines? Ooh, um, I think I'm going to go I, – I don't know. I don't know if this counts, but – I guess it kind of does because it'll go back two years, so I'll include it. I just think it's a surprise in general. Uh, Chase uh, Chase Burns getting mm. picked second. I, I I guess I hope you guys will let me count it. I hope everyone watching will let me count it just because we'll of what we okay what we saw from him at Tennessee two years ago uh, was great stuff. Went to Wake Forest, pretty much did the same thing uh, to my knowledge, and delivered that you know sort of you know power from his arm and whatnot. Him going second, though, is the surprise behind this. I, I think, uh, obviously, Cincinnati loved what they saw out of him and his arm and whatnot. And it, it's, you know, there, there were certainly guys ahead of him. I guess I'll throw Hagen Smith for more, you know, recency in this this sort of surprise here. And, you know, many people thought Hagen Smith was the number one pitcher. Myself, I thought Hagen Smith was the number one pitcher uh, in this draft. But I think that's the biggest surprise is, you know, what exactly did the, did the Cincinnati front office see in Burns that they didn't see in Smith? And they end up going him. But it's just interesting because I think those two were – it was back and forth for who was the number one pitcher in the country, and it ends up being Burns. And that's a surprise for me. And I'm sure, you know, with the Arkansas crowd we get, it's a surprise for them as well because much like them, I thought Hagen Smith would be the number one pitcher taken, and he ends up falling fifth to Chicago. Graham, your biggest surprise. Burns is on the list, but he's not my number one. Um, my number one was uh, the Yankees and what they did with Ben Hess, taking him uh, 26 overall. So I saw him twice in person this year. I saw him against Ole Miss and I saw him against Mississippi State. Not once, like, he's he's got good stuff, but not once was did, was I – blown away like this this is a guy you know over the years you've seen in the sec like this is a guy yeah. everyone can see it that you know that kind of thing not with hess his era was almost six this past season he's got injury issues that one kind of surprised me it just it just felt like the yankees were like we're taking pictures no matter what and all it takes is one team to fall in love with you and obviously the yankees fell in love with ben hess them taking him as high as they did, that kind of surprised me. Well, guess who else had Ben Hess is off the board in the <laughs> first round? <laughs> Their number one story for all the reasons you just outlined. Now, look, um, I know that pro baseball is different. Some of this may be a signability issue. I don't know if they got him to under a slot deal. And, and, and to be fair, Ben Hess did strike out 106 guys in 68 in the third innings. He's a guy that everybody's known for years has been more talented, but in this draft where there were so many good players, especially from the college side, I was also surprised to see that. All right. Number two surprise, Alfred, you got something for us here. I do. I have another guy who I thought would have gone in the first round, but didn't, he went right outside of it in the PPI round. Uh, Ryan Waldschmidt from Kentucky is my surprise. And I guess he's like borderline. He was right there. But he does go in the uh, PPI round to the Diamondbacks. I just thought, you know, Kentucky produced a few of these hitters and players all around. Uh, Petrie, for example, went to the Rays in the second round. But it, they, they produced a lot of these guys where they're on base. Their ability to get on base, I thought, was, you know, 
competitive enough to really show out at at least a minor league level to start. And then beyond that, if they build MLB careers out of it. And Ryan Waldschmidt, I think, was the catalyst to all that. Uh, 470 on base percentage in the SEC is something incredible uh, to get on base. Almost half of the time you're up at the plate. And then even just the pure hitting, uh, 333 average. I guess the the one knock is the power may not be there, but he still hit 14 home runs. I think that's still something you can work with very easily. Uh, and again, just the, the walk rates were up. He, he was a guy that just forced pitchers you know, to get into a tough battle with them every single time. And I thought that was something noteworthy enough to get him a first-round pick, but he falls just outside of it. Alfred, that's a great call. Um, if you watched SEC baseball, the numbers alone don't do Ryan Waldschmidt justice. Felt like that guy was just a walking nightmare to pitch mm -hmm. to. He barreled the ball. He put it to different fields. He worked counts. And here's a kid who just could not stay healthy for much of his career. Finally stayed healthy, caught some breaks. Really happy for him. And I think Graham is – I think technically – that counts as a first-round pick. I know it's not the first-round mm. regular. Does does that officially count as a first-rounder or not? Yes, it does. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So okay. he's technically a first-rounder, but he did. I, I, I you did see him projected a little bit higher, right. Than where he was picked. That you know could have been that lack of full track record scared teams off because right. the last year was great, but you didn't. Ryan Walshwick was nowhere on anybody's radar as a first-round pick for this year, and it may have been. Mm -hmm. The history, but that that's a that's a great call here. All right, Graham, you're up next. Similar story situation. Mine is Dakota Jordan, uh, a guy that was late first round pick. I'm, did did you have him too? Was he on your list? That's my number two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so again, potential first round pick, maybe high second round, and for whatever reason, nobody really knows. Like nothing bad has come out, but. He, he goes in the fourth round to the San Francisco Giants. I'm sure they were like, what in the world is going on here? Like, we're, we're going to take a flyer on him. Why not? He's he's crazy athletic and talented. Again, he did struggle down the stretch in the regular season. I don't know if that scared teams off, but he had a monster regional uh, in Charlottesville and that Virginia regional. He had the walk-off home run. Again, he'll find a spot in the outfield. He's just too talented. I cannot believe that he lasted all the way until the fourth round. Yeah, I didn't see that coming either. Dakota Jordan a month ago was inside everybody's first round. He'd fallen a little bit outside that. I, I will tell you this. I remember watching their SEC tournament game against Vanderbilt, and he was just having fits. Mm -hmm. He couldn't do anything. That was in that spell where he was one for 30 or whatever, and then he finally broke out of it. But he got benched late in that game with an at-bat coming up. Uh, I think I think that – I want. I don't remember if that game went to extra innings. But it was one of those things like you're pretty sure you're going to need Dakota Jordan to maybe hit at one more point, at least field. And they pulled him from the game. And the pans in the dugout uh, were not a great look for him. Um, you know, his teammates were up there getting excited, and he was kind of in the background – I don't know if moping is fair, but I I saw that and I thought at the time, I'm like, I wonder if, if he gets dinged for that. Now, I think, you know, 100 spots in the draft or whatever might be a lot, but that was that, that is a lot. my number two. And, and Dakota Jordan is still a guy who was – he was a two-sport guy coming to Mississippi State, still a little bit raw. I think he's a, um, a draft-eligible sophomore, mm -hmm. so maybe the fact that he's got a little leverage plays into that too. But I was – that was – you and I have been on the same page for these first two. All right, Alfred, lead us off with your number three surprise, please. Uh, my number three, I'm going to go with a guy who I guess it's kind of it, it's kind of similar to the Walt Schmidt thing I was just talking about. Should have gone a little higher than I thought. Um, I, I'm going to go Blake Burke at pick 65. I think – I would like to make the case that Blake Burke – he went to the Brewers at 65. I would like to make the case that he – hits for power with some of the top guys in the SEC, you know, that you can name. And I, once again, I think it was a case of sort of something similar to what Christian Moore went through was, well, if, you know, a lot of the guys ahead of him didn't exist. He would be in the conversation for awards. I think Burke would get a lot more, at least MLB draft recognition for these higher picks. If these guys didn't existed, I mean, a 380 average slugging over 700, uh, 20 home run season last year a ton of RBIs, 61 RBIs as well. And his on base is, you know, surprising considering just how much it's, 
how much it improved from last year. It jumped up almost, you know, uh, like almost a whole new level to 450. Uh, it's a guy who I thought would have gone a little higher. Uh, once again, I, I think the sheer amount of prospects we had in the draft in general makes it a little, uh, a little more kind of reasonable when you boil it down. But I, I think Blake Burke had the case, maybe not to be a uh, number one or a first, not number one, a first round selection, but someone who at least went higher in the sixties where he was picked. Graham. All right. My number three was what Alfred touched on a moment ago, and that's Chase Burns going number two overall to the Cincinnati Reds. I don't know if Paul Skeens had an impact on this and the Reds are like, let's try to get our version of Paul Skeens and, and go with Burns. Everybody knows he can throw 100 miles an hour. His stuff is incredible. His numbers at Wake Forest are like video game-like numbers from this past season. So him going as high as he did, uh, a little surprising for me. You knew he would be a top 10 pick, but him going two overall to the Reds, that, that kind of jumped out at me. All right, my number three surprise, and this is with the, the benefit of it. Let, let's back out maybe after the end of the 2023 season. Graham, if I told you Mississippi State's just about its entire pitching staff, it felt like anybody threw an inning for Mississippi State got picked in this draft. And, and, and picked high, too. You saw what their starting rotation all went off the board and what, like the top 100 picks? I'll, I'll, I'll fact check this, but Gerangela St. who I think is terrific, and once he builds up some endurance, um, 15 overall to the Mariners, was not surprised at all to see him rise up the draft. I don't think anybody had him that high in most mock drafts this spring, but if you watched it, you saw a kid who was getting better quickly. Uh, let's see, next up, we've got on that pitching staff, as I move down my list, Cal Steven was taken 59th by the Rays. Anytime you're taken by the Rays, <laughs> that it feels like it's a validation stamp, Alfred. Uh, you can mm-hmm. you can weigh in on that as our resident Rays fan. But love love that pick. I, I think that kid can really throw strikes. Uh, Nate Dom, who wasn't healthy most of the year, 82nd to the Mets. And then Brooks Auger, who just blew up in the SEC tournament with that start that was one of the most dominant starts we saw all year out of any pitcher on any SEC staff. He goes 190th to the Dodgers, another organization that feels like they know what they're doing with pitchers. Um, Further down the list, other guys that got taken because it just felt like these guys came off the board late in day three. Um, And I swear there's more here. Um, Who am I missing, Graham? Go Go over all the ones you've said. Uh, I, I mentioned the rotation, um, but I know they had a bunch more guys picked too. I feel like um, out of their bullpen, Davis I think got taken. Um, Cody Holcomb of all people got taken this year. It, Phil, I don't remember. If there's an injury in play. We didn't see him much. Um, Cam Schulke, that's who it was. I was trying to think of. So seven or eight pitchers. I, there's at least seven, maybe eight guys taken off that pitch. Like you remember how bad their pitching staff was in in 2023, two, two years ago. Yeah. So if you remember Lamonis, like he he fired the pitching coach in the middle yeah. of the season, and that was kind of like the scapegoat. So what does he do? He hires Justin Parker, his buddy that he had on staff at Indiana. Parker was at South Carolina for three years and he, j- he was lights out. I mean, what a, what a yeah. job he did with the starters in the bullpen this past season at Mississippi state, you know, really turned them around to have all your starters get drafted as highly as they did. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. I, I, I would have never, I just remember they were so bad in 2023 and that, that was mm-hmm. a good call. Justin Parker, I think earned himself a raise with what he did with those guys. And they, they were sure that was a fun staff to watch pitch on weekends for sure. They had about seven or eight guys that they would throw. All of them were pretty good. And that was a team. I still feel like that team kind of got a raw draw. Should have, should have been better than a two getting sent to Virginia, but that is the way it goes sometimes. All right. What have we got up next on our list? We've got uh, three things worth noting, uh, just things that caught your eye for, for whatever reason, don't have to fit in a category of, of this or that. Alfred, give me something that caught your eye. 
Uh, something that caught my eye, it was a uh, later round pick, you know, leading up to right before we were going to do this show. Uh, Lucas Ramirez getting selected to the Angels in the 17th round. A uh, high profile uh, high school kid, Tennessee recruited, uh, son of Manny, Manny Ramirez. If you watch mm-hmm. the MLB, you know very well who that is. Uh, normally outfielder, but you know, these high school kids at this point, they play every all nine positions on the baseball field and can pitch and can get the water cups and can, you know, manage the team and all this stuff. <laughs> so he, he was just, a, he was just a high value prospect that got picked late. Interesting to see. And it seems like all details are pointing to him pursuing a career in the minor league systems of the angels, you know, instead of Tennessee. So it's one guy Tennessee lost, but uh, Graham, you touched on it before with guys like Abernathy coming back and all these other recruits Tennessee has, uh, they seem very well fine, but Ramirez is just something that caught my eye. Graham, you're up. Something worth noting. My number one is actually, it's not SEC related at all, but I couldn't help but wonder when I saw Wake Forest had three top 10 picks, Mm. I was like, how often does that happen? Well, it's only happened one other time, and that was Rice in 2004. Rice. And what All do they have? Two, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. what do those two teams have in common? They did not make it out of the regionals. Wow. Wake Forest this past season, they went 0 for 2. 0 for 2 with three top 10 picks. That's kind of hard to do. And then yeah. I looked at Rice. Rice lost to Texas Southern that year back in 2004. Texas Southern. And they hosted. So that that stood out to me. Just just I know Wake Forest, they've been on a hot streak here, you know, the last what four or five years. Just the fact that they had three top ten picks, did not win 40 games and went 0 and 2 in the regionals. That that kind of blew my mind. All right. My number one storyline is poor old miss. And that is yes, the question mark is intentional because we just don't know. Uh, some of these kids that got drafted may come back, but I'm just thinking, okay, Ole Miss has had a, a rough go of it with Andrew Fisher hitting the portal, winding up at Tennessee, uh, just the, the the tough years, the pitching injuries, and, and you know, the, the draft goes on and, you know, Xavier Revis goes off the board and um, Hunter Elliott. I, I think, I think then Ole Miss have like two of the last six guys picked in the draft between Elliott they, and Carmack. I, yeah, Elliott was super late. With the Dodgers, I mean that's that's like twisting the knife. Like you're you're Mike Bianco, yeah. you're thinking, all right, maybe we get a couple of guys back, and, and then just right before you can take your your breath, a couple guys get sniped. Um, we I think we've talked about some other guys that got pit, but I think I even texted you guys. It's like, man, Ole Miss just this is a program. That seems like it has not been able to catch a break since winning a national title. That just was felt like to me like pouring salt on the wound. The, the way it went down late, but we'll see. Maybe. Maybe Ole Miss can make a competitive NIL offer and get some of these kids back. All right, Alfred, you're up next. Your second thing worth noting uh, that, that you, you caught here. Um, Not to rub salt in the wound, but I think Arkansas had eight draft picks this year, uh, and that kind of MLB talent or MLB-ready talent shows just how restless I think they are getting at having, a at this point, a national title to their name. Uh, I go down the list here. Hagen Smith, obviously, Stovall, uh, Mason Molina, Jared Sprague, Lott, uh, Hudson White, Ben McLaughlin, who's a really good third base prospect to the Diamondbacks later, Jake Faraday, Brady, Ta- Brady Taggart, uh, just all these guys getting picked for them. Uh, and this has been, I mean, Ar- Arkansas has had this in their arsenal. And once again, you know, they, they have all these guys taken in the MLB draft. A lot of key guys, too, you know, when you talk about people in their lineup and whatnot interested to see what they're doing in the portal and how they'll rebound from that. Because like I said, it's a school and a program getting restless for a national title at this point. Graham. Real quick, Alfred, I think they're on track. Like Dave Van Horn, one of the best coaches in the country. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're on track to win one at some point. They're oh just yeah. Too good. Um, all right. My number two is somebody that we haven't discussed yet. And that is Charlie Condon. Why yeah. do I bring him up? It's because he got drafted by the Colorado Rockies. Could oh, you imagine yeah. if, mm. if they, if they hit on him, pun intended, he is going to just destroy baseballs in that ballpark because they, they went all in on Chris Bryant, Bryant in his third year there 
he hasn't really panned out yet. He's still only 32, so maybe he can, but he's just got to get healthy. He's played in less than 150 games for the Rockies oh. in three years. So if, if they hit on Charlie Condon, he could hit balls a long way in Denver. I, I thought about that too. I, I texted somebody when that I was like, he's going to hit 50 bombs every, like if you're playing in a baseball fantasy league and you can stash Charlie Condon right now and, and not hurt yourself, I would, I would do that today uh, because he's going to, I think that that is just, that's a dream scenario for Charlie Condon. Okay. Uh, my second thing worth noting is uh, sniped on the way out. And it's a question mark because I, I just texted a buddy of mine, like, like Florida's like, they got some dudes through the draft that, that Ty Evans didn't get picked. Um, Luke Heyman didn't get picked. And I thought they were going to get away with Colby Shelton. And I believe he was a 20th round pick. Um, let me pull this up that we were talking so many players that my, my mind <laughs> flips when it comes to who got picked where, but, but Shelton got picked. Who was it, Graham? Can you help me out here? He got picked. Okay, here it is. Nationals, 590 overall. I, I don't know what the Nationals bonus pool and, and their other draft picks look like. Um, maybe we can look that up. But that, that's one that, you know, somebody's going to throw a dart at him. Um, Florida was having a pretty good day in terms of of maybe some returnees. But that's one that we'll see if they've got some money to throw his way. That That's probably one that either was a complete dart throw or, or maybe it goes down to the last day. And they, they like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Baltimore didn't sign somebody one year and threw a bunch of money at Carter young who just transferred out of Vanderbilt to LSU in the portal. And I think he signed for well over a million dollars. Sometimes you see stuff pop up that's not on the radar because the team's just got money left. Anytime a guy gets picked um, it, it's a little bit of a risk. So that that's one that kind of mm -hmm. caught my eye. Um, Alfred, you, your third thing worth noting here. Yeah, uh, Texas, congrats on joining the SEC, but they do lose the number one player in the state of Texas to the team I'm wearing on my head, the Tampa Bay Rays. Theo Gillen gets selected by them in the first round. Uh, very, very good bat. Uh, pr one of the better ones in this high school class coming in to the SEC. Uh, it's a tough blow, I guess, for Schlossnagel and his crew there. Uh, obviously, they have NIL money possibly to deal with this and get it back, but it's a first-round pick, so at this point, it seems all but concluded he would play in minor league baseball. Uh, it, it just goes to show, though, that the the amount of talent coming out of Texas is there and how they're, they're a pr baseball program who, with all the rich history and success they've had, that's only going to continue further down the road. And, you know, obviously, that case is true. If they have their high school recruits that haven't even put on burnt orange yet, getting picked in the first round. Graham? All right, my third one, you kind of touched on it earlier, Chris. It's just how good the SEC was and has been for a while now. Um, this is not up to date. This is through the first two days of the draft. But Tennessee has the most picks of any school. That was eight picks uh, through the first two days. Again, very easy to see why the Vols are the national champs with, with that many draft picks. Behind Tennessee, LSU had seven draft picks. Arkansas State, or rather Arkansas, Mississippi State, and Vanderbilt, they all had six. A&M had five draft picks. Uh, just shows you just how deep and talented the SEC is. If you're wondering which team has the most first-round draft picks ever in the SEC, it's Vanderbilt. Uh, the Commodores have 21 first-round picks. That's the third most ever, only behind Stanford and Arizona State. So it just shows you how great the SEC is overall as a conference. Yeah, and, and to your point, I mean, if we'd been doing this show four, five, six years ago, Vanderbilt would have been dominating the conversation in a lot yeah. of ways. It just shows you how much the league has kind of, I'm not going to say caught up, I don't know if the, what term, how much competitive balance and how many elite programs are in this league now. All right, one, one thing that kind of caught my eye, I'll, I'll just file this away under the, the headline of talented injured guys, and there's two guys I want to talk about in particular because when this first guy got drafted, it's like, oh, I totally forgot about him. That's Tanner Witt at Texas. Graham, you remember how good Tanner Witt was a couple of years ago? Big time. Before he got hurt, I think I think in, in 21 he was great, and he threw – Oh, man, I think like 11 innings in 2022 hasn't pitched since. 
He got taken in the 14th round by somebody, I believe. That's one. And I think he was probably a better college arm, maybe, than a pro guy. I might be getting that wrong anyway. But Tanner Witt was an elite college arm, and, and it just completely slipped off my radar until he got picked. All right, and another guy, and this is a guy that if you're a diehard SEC fan, you may know this name, but Vanderbilt got Andrew Dukanich through the draft a couple of years ago. Could have been a first-rounder. Pulled a hamstring last year. I think uh, had an elbow injury this year. I don't think the guy pitched 15 innings total at Vanderbilt. He's got six pitches. I've I've seen him pitch. He's got elite stuff. Had a chance to be a really, really special arm for Vanderbilt, but we just never got to see it because of the injuries. He's going to sit out, I think, all of 2025 um, with reconstructive elbow surgery, and the Cardinals took him in the seventh round. But those are two guys that that probably – weren't on anybody's draft conversations for the most part. They were just two of the more talented. Again, with Dukanich, we never got to see it, but two super talented arms. And when they got picked, it's like, ah, be interested to see where this goes because if they ever get healthy, um, it, it, I'm interested to see, especially Dukanich, what, what that path looks like. All right, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a wild card at you, see if you're prepared here. Um, give me a hot take on the way out. I've got one in mind. See, if you need a little bit of time to prepare, I can go ahead. Um, in fact, I will, uh, since I sprung this on you. Here's my <laughs> my hot take of the draft. Uh, Dylan Dryling will have the best career of any of the Tennessee players taken. Just I can see like it. His, like his bat. That That's, you know, degree of probability hit. I don't know. I just felt like every time that kid needed to get a hit. There was ice water in his veins. I, I feel like, you know, he, he, he's not going to remind you of, you know, Ricky Henderson. But that's a bad analogy because Ricky wasn't a great defender. Um, he, he's not He's not going to win a gold glove in the outfield. Uh, but I just believe in the, the bat-to-ball skills and and just what he did for the balls. I, I, that, that's my hot take. He will end up being the best player of all those guys, and that's a, that's a lengthy list to t- choose from of all the Tennessee guys. All right, who's who's up next? Give me a give me an on the fly hot take on your way out. Who wants to go? I got go, it. Go for it, Alfred. Get your get your. I got it ready. All right, I will say I will say, Chris, you saw what they did with Wyatt Langford and how quickly he's excelled, and he's instantly become one of the best hitters in their lineup. There's no telling what they could do possibly with Dylan Trilly and how that could work out. But mine's going to build off of. One Jack Caglione. The uh, MLB comparison uh, that they gave him was Aaron Judge at his best. If he were to get to that point, I can definitely see something like that. But for the time being, I think he gets called up and he is playing in Kauffman Stadium shortly after the opening di- opening day, opening weeks late of the 2025 season. I think mm. it's that early. Uh, I think he's going to excel really, really quickly. I mean, you talk about him coming into Double A. I, I think you see close to double A you know, talent on the mound that you see out of some of these SEC pitchers Caglione faced. And once again, we just saw how good he was. I think that's only going to continue. And, and I think out of all the guys taken in this draft, Jack Caglione is the one who gets called up the quickest and first. And that happens very quickly into the 2025 season. Boy, that is a hot take. It is it is fascinating though. Like I can't wait to watch him play. And if he does make it to the show. Yeah. <laughs> 2025. That's that's fast. Um mine is just Charlie Condon. I just think he should have been the number one pick in the draft. No offense to Oregon State, but how many people saw them play this past season? Yeah. They're an outstanding program, but Charlie Condon, just what he did this past season, his video game like numbers. Him falling to number three, I'm sure the Rockies are absolutely ecstatic as they should be. I just thought he should have been a top two pick and not number two. So Charlie Condon is is mine. How fast will he make it to the Rockies and Denver? We'll see. But I, I think he's just got stud written all over him. All right, guys, I knew I forgot something. Um, winners and losers. So let, let's give us your winners and losers. Uh, Alfred, who are your winners? in the SEC in this draft? Uh, 
I guess the I guess a winner. Uh, they lost a lot of guys, but it just shows what they've done and what they've been able to do. We talked about it before on the show already. Tennessee. I, I'm just going to put it as a winner, just from the sense of the sheer amount of people they had picked. Uh, it feels like you know, it, it, you didn't go a long time in this draft for at least the front half of it, where you didn't hear a name called from Tennessee at some point. It just shows what Tony Vitale has done, what he's going to continue to do, um, and. Like I said, I mean, it's only going to continue to build. They've been, you know, hunting guys down in the porter, por- oh, porter, in the portal very, very well. Uh, they'll, you know, and they're just going to keep rolling with it. I-, I think, you know, again, you can look at it as a loser way just based on all the guys they're losing. But at the same time, it's like, wow. I mean, that, that, that was a job well done, to say the least, in Knoxville. Graham, your I, winners. I have three winners. Tennessee, as Alfred just touched on, just – they lose a lot of talent, obviously, but they're bringing a bunch of talent in from the portal. And then their high school signees that are bypassing the draft and will end up in Knoxville. LSU, the other one, same thing, just all their talent they got coming in portal wise and uh, high school recruits. And then the other one, uh, Texas A&M. They've only had five people drafted through the first two days. Why is that a winner for me? Well, it shows you that they just played for a national championship and they got a lot of that talent coming back. So I expect, at least short-term-wise, Texas A&M is going to have another monster season this upcoming year. Yeah, I feel like most of the teams in the league were were kind of winners in one regard. I think I think Tennessee was a winner getting some commits through the draft, building its brand through having a bunch of guys drafted and, and a lot of guys, you know, day one and day two. I think LSU for the reasons we, we mentioned, uh, we talked about Schmidt pulling out of the draft. Uh, Derek Curiel, who was a top 120 guy, I think uh, by some people, at least by MLB Pipeline, he pulled his name out of the draft. So you'll see a lot of schools that have two guys in the top 125 that, that come out of the draft. That happened. Um, you know, just Jared Jones not getting picked. Stuff like that. Um, LSU did have some losses on the pitching staff, but I think – oh, and there was somebody else on LSU too that didn't get picked. Um, let me run through my list for a minute. Let me excuse me. It's an outfielder, and I've drawn a blank. Um, Paxton Kling. Kling was considered a top 400 prospect, I think, at Baseball America. So that's another – I think he's a draft-eligible sophomore. So uh, a lot of guys could have – left Baton Rouge or not come to Baton Rouge that are going to be back. I think um, Florida, for reasons I mentioned, we, we talked about Heyman coming back. Shelton, they'll have to throw some money at him. Uh, Florida had a couple of top 200 guys that it got through the draft, and I'm probably going to botch the pronunciation here, but Justin Rittenauer, I guess it is, W-H-R-I-T-E-N-O-U-R, top 150 guy was not selected. Actually, just outside the top 150 was not selected. Uh, Jackson Barberi was a top 100 guy, according to MLB Pipeline. He didn't get picked, so the Gators got some good news. And another team, uh, it feels like this team has gotten just picked apart in recent years. It's draft class. That's Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt only had one guy taken, had, had three or four guys that could have easily been in the top 250 but are coming to national look Vanderbilt's recruiting class. It's not the the days of Drew Jones and Jordan Lawler and guys that, you know, are committed and you're like, you know, there's a better chance of the meteor hitting the earth than those guys showing up <laughs> on campus. But um, Vanderbilt's also kind of gotten picked apart <laughs> with some guys outside that tier that have gone and, and the vast time him getting through the draft. I think that was a big thing for them too. So I felt like Vanderbilt came out a little bit more of a winner in some ways than it had in recent years. All right, uh, losers. This is a hard one to uh, to to come up with. I'll, I'll let I'll let Alfred lead us off here again. Yeah, it's it, it's very hard to choose. I was kind of just like while you guys were talking, scrambling a little bit to see what I could come up with in that regard because it's like it's what we just talked about. I mean, you had teams lose a bunch of guys, but at the same time, that's like, oh well, you had. You just did a good job with getting that talent out into the MLB, which is what you're supposed to do. It's kind of a side goal you have for your program. Uh, If I had to do a loser, and I hate to do it because it seems unfair almost, but just for the sake of this, I'll do it. I'm going to go with Georgia uh, Mm -hmm. just because how do you replace Charlie Condon? 
you know, in all realness. At the same time, they can look at it as winners. You produced, you know, as Graham thinks, and as you know, as I think, it, there's a very good case for it. The best hitter easily in this draft, but you and you produced that and got that to the MLB. But how do you replace that is the big question for them. And I, I think that's going to be something interesting to watch going forward. Uh, I, I just I'm not sure, you know, what they're going to do about that. They're obviously not going to get another hitter like that, but can they get hitting similar to it? Is going to be a huge, massive question. Uh, and they lost the other two guys they lost in this draft were Fernando Gonzalez and Corey Collins, two other good hitters for them as well. That adds, I guess, a tiny bit of salt to the wound. But the really the the big elephant in the room with what I just said is Condon. And I, I think just for if I have to say something loser like for the for the loser of the draft is going to be Georgia in that regard. And once again, probably one of the bigger stories this offseason in the SEC is going to be what they're going to do with their hitting now that he's gone heading into 2025. Yeah, um, on that, uh, they also got Corey Collins taken, but they, you know, they did get um, Colby Branch got through the draft and Chandler Marsh got through the draft too. So, yeah, I mean, obviously the biggest guy lost, but there was a little good news mm -hmm. for Georgia in there too. Graham, your losers in the draft. Yeah, that's a good pick, Alfred. Loser feels kind of harsh, but. I don't know what the word would be. I'm going to pick Ole Miss here. And yeah. we've talked about the pitching. The other one that we haven't talked about yet is Slade Caldwell, the highest uh, signee that Ole Miss had out of Jonesboro, Arkansas. So he he got picked 29th overall. So, again, he, he was on campus, moved in, everything in the dorm, all that stuff. So he gets selected by the Diamondbacks 29th overall. And so he's, he's more than likely he's gone. Like he's, he's not going to be at Ole Miss. So that's a, that's a bad break there for the rebels. And again, just the pitching, what does Hunter Elliott do? What does Xavier Rivas do? Those are two guys that have been in the rotation the last two years. So that, those, that that's my pick for Ole Miss in the spot. Yeah, I went, uh, I had a couple that stuck out, uh, Missouri always tough to win at Missouri. They had two guys that were rated in the top 250 by either Baseball America or MLB Pipeline, Titus Sissel, Ethan Bagwell, uh, both off the board. Had some quality pitchers who got taken late in the draft. I would presume you, you'd think those guys would probably take the money rather than come back. And, and I think the other one, I feel like Mississippi State kind of got picked apart. We talked about the pitching staff. Uh, and I'm not sure some of these guys probably don't have eligibility anyway. I, I can't even keep up with. I mean, you got guys playing college football that were high school graduates in 2018, so I have to consult the rule book <laughs> with these things sometimes. Um, but I mean, it, it just felt like every Mississippi State player I knew got drafted. Uh, David Marshawn went late uh, again. Not sure where he was in terms of eligibility. Um, if there's a grad school, but I mean, it was just like you know, kind of high sack. Um, got picked uh, in addition to the pitcher. Now, Hunter Hines was one that they did get through, and that's a big get for them because Hines had a little bit of a disappointing year, and that'll play to State's advantage. So not all bad for State, but I just, as the draft unfolded, felt like, man, every single guy that, that I really liked on that team this year is getting picked. And so Chris Lamona's got a lot of, a lot of big shoes to fill in, uh, in Starkville this year. All right, that's a wrap for our draft episode here at SEC Baseball Weekly. We'll be back next week. We will talk uh, about the portal and some late-breaking developments. Maybe some guys will land between now and then. We will talk about some more tournaments. we got some more tournament fields coming out. Might even do a mailbag. Uh, we'll wait and see about that. But in any case, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. For Alfred Esmond and Graham Doty, I'm Chris Lee. We are Southeastern 14, excuse me, Southeastern 16, presented by <laughs> Bet Online. <laughs>